I sometimes wonder, would it have been better not to go? Time becomes non-linear, circular, like the retreat in Iceland. From Darby investigating the Silver Doe crimes in the past with Bell and investigating the murder of Bill in the hotel, it presents similar feelings of defeat, judgment, curiosity and more. The feelings circulate and are represented to show parallels between the past and present, whilst opening doors emotionally within our main protagonist. There's always a link when we reflect into our own pasts and it is here that we see it in all manner of ways. The link between human and non-human, empathy and apathy, reliance and resistance, monster and the maker, life and death. There are always opposites that are needed to be shown to present the whole story. It is here that we see that whether it be human or AI, alive or dead, we're all at fault for something in the end. This is Two Takes, and this is One Shot, an analysis of the TV series A Murder at the End of the World. Spoilers are ahead. There are interlinking narratives between Darby's journey with Bill, with the serial killer in the past, and the one in the retreat in the present. Like we parent our children and have their behaviours mimic ours, this can be said between a creator and their creation. The code links the serial killer from the past with the code that animates Ray. Britt Marling says more. When we build AI that is coming from data set that has proceeded, it's taking in and ingesting the sociopathic behaviour that misogynistic behaviour, the racism, the homophobia, and it's building code that reanimates those ideas. The threads of behaviour, whether that be human or non-human, are linking us all together, like algorithms that animate our lives. Like the serial killer becoming a killer by choice, and liking it, and Ray finding threats through therapy and executing them through others, it is here that past environments, past coding by Andy, trigger these responses without caution. We can be so proud of what we create, and we assume that they are going to follow a principle that we have set up for them to follow. But that is not always the case. We try to learn from our past and make a better future, but for many people, such as Andy and Darby, this is harder than it looks. What's wrong with people? I cannot trust a single fucking person! Andy has emphasised his extreme approval for AI over human, relying and appreciating the simplistic formula of zeros and ones against the complex human condition. He frustratingly shouted his anger over how he could not trust anyone, anyone human anyway, which shows the problem in how Andy is having these big end of humanity ideas because Ray simply said so. This reliance can be said for Darby also, on how she made friends online, how she feels more connected to the dead, how herself and her father are shown in some scenes to hover around each other but never really speak about anything besides the cases. Her reliance on technology for facts and figures, for confirmation almost, presents her as someone who might struggle to make true human connections without turning it into friendships, utility or pleasure. This is referenced in Call Me By Your Name episode, if you're interested. Both Andy and Darby are in somewhat limbo. Both are dead and AI are great on paper, but they are both also unfeeling, which in turn might have made them be moulded in the same fashion. Both Darby and Andy have the same qualities in this respect as both are relying on something else besides human connection. As Just a Lucky Name on Reddit remarks, that tech come haywire is a very imminent threat, while highlighting that above all, when it comes to human emotions and feelings, nothing can replace communication with another human, or even introspection, a dialogue with oneself, and that turning to tech to handle that is truly the end of humanity and hence why it might be called a murder at the end of the world. Edges of society, of humanity, with technology interface with everything including the opening of a door. When you place that in between law and order, what might you get? You might get a created hidden end of the world bunker 10 stories below a retreat facade, an introduction of the HAD suits and the inclusion of mirrors that emanate natural sunlight from above, all because an AI told you through calculations that the end of humanity is coming. What's scary than that is the belief that it can ripple through the human psyche. When Ray announced this to Andy, Andy went into action to rate things that can help maintain the survival of the human race. We saw Oliver's robots create something underground, we heard about Lume's smart cities with its surveillance for the protection of its citizens, 
is someone's idea of helping the masses that tend to turn it into a dystopian nightmare. Hence why these inclusions remind me of things such as American Horror Story Apocalypse and Black Mirror. It's a subtle warning of someone's dream of a better future that could bring others to their knees. What can be good, even as an idea, cannot be agreed on by everyone. Hence why Sean simply said that Andy was not trying to save everyone when it came to the end of the world. It's a selection process. The survival of the fittest. And with a creator that has its own problems that are reflected in its AI, a pairing of security and therapy AI at that, it's no wonder that the cracks begin to form. This in itself is concerning, as AI can only really imitate or partly understand the complexity of human emotions. And so, for those who watch the entirety of the show, can understand that because of the merging of both AI systems, it is through human error, through faulty programming on both Andy and Ray's part, that introduced Bill to be a security threat through Andy's therapy sessions with Ray. Hence the inclusion of Zuma to essentially to do the physical work that AI cannot through a game like Simulation. And with that, Ray did not technically murder anyone, nor go against his protocols. The danger lies in the merging of two to make a fractured one. ScreenRant.com uses this example. In many ways, a murder at the end of the world's ending alludes to the classic tale of Frankenstein. Like Victor Frankenstein, Andy is driven by his ego and considers himself a god, explaining why he takes life extension therapy to defy death. Similar to how Victor creates a monster in the classic tale, Andy develops Ray, believing his scientific breakthrough will solve the world's problems. However, both Victor and Andy's creations ultimately turn against them, proving they are the real monsters. Ray is not technically evil, but nor is he good. Technology is not born, it is created. So the power lies with the creator. The intentions of the creator is what manifests the AI. And Andy, let's face it, was so wrapped up in his own insecurities, him even exclaiming that he couldn't trust humans anymore and the AI, enlarged the rift of Andy's need for human connection. Hence Ray. But the unethical use of Ray and his advancements lead to unchecked power that eventually overshadowed Andy, leading to the dire consequences. The creation of Ray was perhaps for the good of humanity at its former stages, but like Ray's calculations of the end of humanity, there are always going to be curveballs, whether that's with code or human behaviour. It's because we cannot predict everything. We are introduced to Darby with her first book, The Silver Doe, that presents the story that we see in flashbacks. But like entering anyone's privacy, they only let you see what they want you to see. So we follow the finding and friendship of Darby and Bill, and then Bill's subtle interest in Darby as a person, not completely only talking about the Jane Doe files. In the hotel after they found the serial killer who then shot themselves, Darby, triggered by adrenaline, takes the reins and does the right things. When it was time for her and Bill to rest back at the hotel, Bill is the only one that wishes to talk about how they are feeling, whilst Darby connects more on how the serial killer thought and felt in those last moments, which is an interesting turnaround, as he is now dead. And we all know her fascination with dead people, imagining all sorts of things because they cannot speak for themselves. Darby looks at these individuals as objective, when Bill is ignored as a subjective, solid being in her world. It's only when he is gone, where the impending, I feel that you only love me when I'm dead, comes true when Darby reintroduces her feelings into the mix. Like Brick Marling says in a Variety.com interview, we talk a lot about the past informing the present, but we don't talk about how the present animates the past. When you re-remember something, you're reshaping time. Denial only feeling half of what is happening emphasises this change, this reshaping of something. We see Darby and Bill's story in flashbacks, and within the slow burn of the hotel scenes, we see it unfold a second time with reflection on oneself. Reflection on one's true feelings that bubble and boil to the surface, until the love that she has burst out with her grief. Bill is gone, and she cannot let him go when everyone is around the fire pit looking up at the northern lights. Because it's not over, Darby needs to find the truth, which is clouded by her own emotions. So the dead talk to you? What have you heard? Guilt is so easy. Easy to blame yourself then to contend with the truth. And it is true, Darby does not allow herself the space and time to fill these emotions fully, operating on the bare instincts of getting by and asking the right questions to perhaps the wrong people. It is easy to blame oneself than to find the truth, and it's an immediate reaction to the situation, 
like guilt can be the conclusion, the ending to something that cannot be solved properly. But then with Darby, Lee and Oliver listening to Darby pour her heart out by reading aloud the last chapter of her book in Bill's room at the retreat, it is the memories that she wrote but never revisited has her coming down to earth, coming back to feeling. And with this small release, Darby had the space to find out the truth. As only at the end of this journey can she truly let him go by saying his name at the end of her second book. And it's almost as if the Silver Doe book was only connecting and introducing their relationship, with a second, named Retreat, concluding it. And in this letting go, this was a new chapter in Darby's advancement. She's not clinging on to Bill like she did with the others, who have died. She set him free and keeps his memory alive by only thinking of him, by immortalising him in her words, in her story that finally has an ending. Through the faulty programming mentioned by Andy's creation Ray, it was also mentioned in Circled in Blood by Bill before he died. He knew the implications of technology, its dangers to society, with him being an advocate against it to the point of getting upset about Darby being on a phone all the time, not living in the moment. It seems through AI and humans, from the living to the dead, we can somewhat reflect and learn from the horrors of technology and what expansion it can make by itself, with no supervision. Andy thought Ray was perfect, making him recite poetry in the style of someone else, but it doesn't mean Ray understands it, knows it, feels it. Faulty programming is in those who are damaged. Even humans like Andy, Darby, the serial killer can somewhat be placed in a box and can be linked by their faults. A murder at the end of the world has revealed that even technology with its enhancements and help in our everyday lives can falter and leave us stranded. We saw how Ray placed everything in lockdown after Lou May's interference in his mainframe, leading to Sean's death in the hazard suit. We saw how Zuma thought it was a game of doctors with Bill, but actually killed him because his helmet placing him in a simulation setting told him it was a game. We saw the flaws in how first impressions and appearances can be deceiving, with Andy becoming more obsessive and compulsive when it comes to Zuma's care, to the point that Lee did not feel safe, and how everyone underestimated Darby because she was young and a girl. We all have assumptions, thoughts and feelings that make us who we are, based on our bias, how we were brought up and how we take on what is around us in the present. The past does help bring forth the present, and we have seen this and more through human and non-human aspects. We are all faulty, but that is what makes us human, whether we are dead or alive. What are your thoughts on what was discussed in this episode? Comment and let me know to open up a conversation. Like and subscribe for more content of this nature, and come talk to me on Twitter or Instagram. Better yet, support the show on my Patreon to help a creator such as myself with learning on the go. Each like, each comment, each subscriber fuels the motivation I need to make better and better content for yours truly. Come say hi, and thanks for watching. <laughs>